Hey everyone, welcome back. My students often ask me why there's such a discrepancy between their high school grades and their scores on the SAT or the ACT. I cover this in much more detail in video five. Check it out. In that video, I discuss how there is a significant gap between a high school curriculum and what topics are considered fair game on these exams. The SAT and the ACT will contain topics that you've likely never seen before. But there's another important factor as well. These tests present questions in ways that your high school classes don't. They're more about conceptual thinking than pure computation. And a very popular branch of this is how to model a situation. The tests like to have you use a math expression to represent a real world scenario. And this can be tricky. You're not just solving an equation or memorizing a formula. So in this video, let's cover some of the most popular types of modeling questions that appear on the SAT and the ACT. If you find it helpful, please hit the like button, share, and subscribe. And leave a comment below with any questions that you have on this topic or other math topics that you'd like me to cover in the future. And be sure to hit the notification bell so you can be updated whenever I post a new video. I appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, let's get to the modeling questions. Let's start with modeling a linear situation. Some of you might remember this first question from video 24. Let's quickly refresh the concept and then we'll get to some harder variations. Melissa's balloon falls by a constant amount each day. The height of the balloon can be represented by the equation h equals negative 0.75x plus 15. What does the 0.75 represent and what does the 15 represent? So just to recap, they're using the equation of a line to represent a situation. The equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. In that equation, the m is the slope and the b is the y-intercept. So what does that mean in context of this question? Well, the negative 0.75 is the slope. That tells you how much the balloon is falling. Each day it's falling 0 0.75, 0 0.75, and etc. And the 15 is the b term. That's the y-intercept, or where you start on the y-axis. So if we were to graph that, that would represent the starting height, or where you are when the time is zero. And this is a very popular type of question on both exams. So when a question gives you the equation of a line to represent a situation, the slope means the rate of change, the y-intercept means the initial value, the x represents the unit of time, and the x-intercept means how long it takes for the measurement to reach zero, or in this case, how long until the balloon hits the ground. Let's try another. A credit card reward program gives the customer 700 points for signing up. A customer then earns 450 points on the card each month. Write an equation to represent how long it will take in Q months until the customer will earn 3,500 points. I'll give you a minute. Press pause, give it a shot. The question says that the customer will earn 450 points every month. That means it's a linear situation. Every month they're earning the same amount. So we could use the equation of a line. So remember, in y equals mx plus b, the m is the rate of change, and b is where you start. So in this case, the 450 is the rate of change. That would be the slope. And we're starting with 700 points. That would be the y-intercept. And we're trying to get to the final amount of 3,500. So the equation would read 3,500 equals 450q plus 700. And now that q represents the time. In video 24, I introduced the concept of cousin questions. Whenever you can, you want to identify the brand of question that's in play. This credit card question is very much a cousin of Melissa's balloon, and I always have my students call this concept Melissa's balloon. But now let's look at a harder variation. The number of essays that Tina has left to grade each day can be modeled by the equation E equals 64 minus 8H, where E represents the number of essays she has left to grade after H hours. What does the 64 represent, and what does the 8 represent? Notice what they're doing here. It's still the equation of a line. However, it's backwards. It doesn't appear as y equals mx plus b. It appears as y equals b minus mx. In other words, they're starting with the y-intercept and then subtracting mx. So what does that mean? Well, the 64, in this case, would be the y-intercept, and that's where we start. So in the context of Tina grading the essays, that means it's the number of essays that she starts with at the top. And then from there, the 8 is the slope. That has to be the change. 
So in this case, it's the number of essays she's able to grade each hour. So here's a slight variation of Melissa's balloon. If the equation y equals d minus rw represents how much work remains, the y is the amount of work that's left, the d is the amount of work that you started with, r is the rate at which you work, and w is the time. So let's now look at a cousin of this variation. Sand is dripping out of an hourglass at a constant rate. The number of grains of sand left in the hourglass can be modeled by the equation s equals 37,000 minus 1483m, where m represents how many minutes have gone by since the sand started dripping. And what's the best interpretation of each number here? I'll give you a minute. Press pause. Give it a shot. Remember, this is the equation of a line, it's just backwards, b minus mx. So that 37,000 would be the b, or the y-intercept. That means it's how many grains we have at the start. And the 1483 is the slope. That's the rate of change, or in this case, how many grains fall per minute. And then the s is the number of grains left. So that's a slightly harder version of Melissa's balloon. And let's kick it up a notch again. Here's another harder version where they don't tell you the rate of change. A bottle company produces a constant amount of bottles each hour. After four hours, the company has produced 8,300 bottles. After seven hours, the company has produced 9,275 bottles. Come up with an equation to represent how many bottles the company will produce after H hours. This is a harder variation because they're not telling you the rate of change. However, you can find it. The key is that it said the company is making a constant amount of bottles each hour. That means it's a linear situation. So let's think about what this would look like if we graphed it on an xy plane. Just like Melissa's balloon, the x-axis would be the unit of time, but now the bottles would be the y-axis. And remember, we could think of the rate of the change as the slope. So if we think of these numbers as xy coordinates, we can plot it as 4, 8300, and 7, 92, 75. And finding the rate of change means finding the slope. So if the formula for slope is change in y over change in x, in this case that would be the change in bottles over the change in time. So using those numbers as coordinates, that would be 9275 minus 8300 over 7 minus 4. That works out to 975 over 3, which would give us 325. So 325 is the slope. In the context of this question, that means how many bottles they're making each hour. So that's the m term. But to get the full equation of a line, we need the y-intercept as well. How can we do that? There's many ways, but here's what I think is the simplest way. If the company's making 325 bottles each hour, we can work backwards from four hours to the start to see what they had when the time was zero. So keep in mind, at four hours, it was 8,300. And from there, we know they're making 325 an hour, so we could just keep subtracting backwards. In other words, after three hours, they would have 79.75, and continuing to subtract, two hours was 76.50, one hour was 73.25, and at the start was 7,000. That means the y-intercept would be 7,000, the amount they had when the time was zero. So the full equation of the line would be y equals 325h plus 7,000. 325 is the slope, or the rate of change, h is the time, and 7,000, or the y-intercept, is the starting amount. So this is a harder version of Melissa's balloon. I call it the bottle variation. Simply put, if they don't tell you the rate of change for a linear situation, you can treat the data like coordinates and find the slope. And to find this, it's the change in units over the change in time. Let's look at another cousin of this. Ryan is restringing guitars. He is so consistent that he can string the same number of guitars each day. After three days, he has restrung 111 guitars, and after five days, he has restrung 175 guitars. How many will he have completed by the end of the eighth day? I'll give you a minute. Press pause, give it a shot. The key to the question is that he can do the same amount each day. That means it's a linear situation. So the rate at which he works can be thought of as the slope. So, Thinking of this data as coordinates, we could say 3, 111, and 5, 175. And then from there, we do the same thing as the bottle question to find the slope. Change in Y over change in X would now be the change in guitars over the change in days. So using these numbers, 
175 minus 111 over 5 minus 3. That would give us 64 over 2 or 32. So that's the slope, or in this case, the amount of guitars he's able to restring each day. And from there, we could just move forward from day 5 to day 8, always adding 32. So if after 5 days he's made 175, keep adding 32. 6 days would be 207, 7 days would be 239, and after 8 days it would be 271. The answer is 271. So again, when they give you a linear situation but they don't tell you the rate of change, you can find it. Treat the data like coordinates and find the slope. All of the questions so far have dealt with linear situations, but let's see how a modeling question can also apply to something other than the equation of a line. Donald builds a machine that projects a tennis ball into the air. He determines that the height of the ball can be modeled by the function h of t equals negative t squared plus 7t plus 18, in which t represents the time in seconds and h of t represents the height in feet. What is the height of the ball when it comes out of the machine? And how long will it take for the ball to hit the ground? So before we start, let's just visualize a ball being thrown in the air. If you were to throw a ball in the air, it would be a curve, or more specifically, a parabola. It would peak and then fall. So we can't use the equation of a line anymore. We need to use the equation of a parabola. And that's what they're giving us here. Notice this equation follows the format y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. That's standard form of a parabola. And in standard form of a parabola, that c term is the starting height, or the y-intercept. So in the case of the ball, it means this ball is starting 18 feet in the air. That would always be the c term. Now let's get to the second part of the question, figuring out how long it would take for the ball to hit the ground. So let's go back to Melissa's balloon for a moment. Remember what we said, that y-intercept was the starting point. Then the balloon would fall until it hit the ground, and that was the x-intercept. The x-intercept is where the measurement reaches zero. And at the x-intercept, it means your y-value is zero. So when they want to know where a measurement runs out, it's another way of saying, set the equation equal to zero. So setting this equation to zero would say, zero equals negative t squared plus 7t plus 18. And now we have a trinomial, which means it's time to factor. The first step, you always want to get that a term to be positive. So dividing everything through by negative one would give us zero equals t squared minus 7t minus 18. And now trinomial factoring, we want to think about what terms would multiply to that negative 18 and add or subtract to that negative 7. That would give us t plus 2 times t minus 9. And solving for each, t would equal negative 2 and t would equal 9. But remember, the question wants to know a time in seconds. And you can't have a negative time. That's not possible. So we can cross out the negative 2. The answer is 9. So this is another popular brand of question that each test really likes. When a question uses a quadratic to model the path of a projectile, or any nonlinear situation, the starting height is the c term, and you could figure out when it hits the ground by setting it equal to zero and factoring it. It's kind of like Melissa's balloon, because the starting point is the y-intercept, and the ending point is the x-intercept. They're just testing that concept on a parabola rather than a line. Let's look at one more nonlinear situation. Samantha has two samples of the same substance. Each one starts at a weight of 1986 grams. She adds a chemical to the first sample, which will make it grow 12% every day. She adds a different chemical to the second sample, which will make it decay 15% each day. Write an expression to represent the amount of each substance after d days. Now, in case you don't know the formula for exponential growth or decay, I'll give it to you so you could start. This is always adding or subtracting the same percent. So that's not linear, that's exponential. The formula for exponential growth is y equals a times 1 plus r to the t. In that equation, your y is the final amount, a is the initial amount, r is the rate, always expressed as a decimal, and t is the time. And decay is the same thing, except it's just 1 minus the rate rather than 1 plus the rate. So, now that you know that, I'll give you a minute. Press pause, give it a shot. So let's start with the first substance, which is growing 12%. So we start with the initial amount for A, 1986, and then 1 plus the rate would be 1 plus 0.12. Remember, you have to make it a decimal. And to the power of time, they're defining the days as D. So 
that would be 1986 times 1.12 to the d. And then for decay, it would be 1 minus the rate of 0.15. So 1986 times 0.85 to the power of d. Let's try one more, but let's make this one a little harder. A city has a population of 5 million people. It grows by 3% every 5 years. Write an expression to represent the total population after p years. This one's a little more challenging. Press pause, give it a try. Let's start with the equation. y equals a, 1 plus r to the t. Well, we know that a is the initial amount, or 5 million, and they tell us that the rate is 3%. That would be 0.03. So plugging that in, y equals 5 million times 1 plus 0.03 to the t, and then combining that in the parentheses, 5 million times 1.03 to the time. Now what makes this question challenging is the time variable. If this had just said it happened every p years, the power would be p. But that's not what it says. It says over p years, it's going to happen every five years. How could we do that? Always pick numbers when you have variables. This makes it much more concrete. So let's forget about p for a moment. Let's say over 30 years, it happened every five years. How many times did it happen? Six. And how do we know that? 30 divided by five we take the total time and divide it by how often it occurs. So instead of saying 30 over 5, it would just be p over 5. That means the time is now p over 5. So the final answer would say y equals 5 million times 1.03 to the power of p over 5. This deals with the concept of widgets that we saw in chapter 10. Check it out here. It's a harder concept and just takes a little practice. There are a lot of good examples in that video which deal with that concept. So these are some of the most popular ways that the SAT and ACT will ask you to model a situation. Again, it's not about solving an equation or memorizing a rule. It's about conceptual thinking. Easier said than done. So keep practicing. These questions are very popular and they could earn you a lot of points on each test. Thanks for watching. And remember, plan your work, work your plan. Thank you.